As in previous months, this is the second part of a two-part series. In the first part, we lay the foundation of the information. Think of it as the foundational knowledge. While the second part will showcase how we apply the learning in our spinning. What does contrastive value look like in our spinning? Can we use it to our advantage? Sometimes just being aware of this stuff is a good place to start, even if we aren't necessarily ready to experiment with it in our making. Spoiler alert though, we use this stuff all the time. We just might not realize that there is a name for some of it. So as usual, I put the call out to the Woolen Spinning community for their participation in the contrast of value this month. I was really curious to see what they would come up with and what they would produce particularly because not everyone has access to Menz's book to look at what she did. So I'm excited to share with you their work. It was so much fun to see what everyone came up with, so let's get into it. If you are new here, please take a moment to check out the indices that are linked for you in the Patreon post and in the down bar below if you are watching this on YouTube. To be able to see all the posts that are available to you each month, please have a look at the Ketchup and Pickles housekeeping post for April of 2023. That will be released around the middle of the month, so by the time you see this, it will be released. So in part one of our conversation this month, we discussed contrast of value and how it affects our work. Because contrast of value is the first thing that we notice when we look at a piece, it is the most important contrast to take into consideration. When I learned about this earlier last year, it really changed how I looked at the braids of fiber hanging on the walls of booths at fiber festivals. I began looking at those braids more in terms of how they made me feel. We learned about how different value keys elicit different feelings in the viewer, which means we have a lot of power when it comes to creating our pieces, whether it's a sweater, a woven item, or something else. Next, we discussed the individual value keys and how they differ. So I went through and combined by drum carding colors together with just one pass to see if I could create each of them, each of the value keys. My reflections on my experiments is what we are going to discuss today. As well, we looked at how to create a value scale with white and black tops that many have pulled out so that they can create all sorts of blend, color blending samples. I created a white to black value scale and have been working away on an orange shade scale from the purest hue of orange that I could make with what I have all the way to 100% black. This can be illuminating as you start to see the differences you can create by just adding a little bit of white or black in the varying amounts to create these amazing scales. I encourage you to try this and I will continue sharing them on the podcast for others to see and learn from. It is invaluable. I also share with you today a couple of the value scales that people have in progress. Um, and I look forward to sharing those with you in a little bit. Last, I left you with some questions about creating chromatic grays. I wondered if it would be valuable to spend a moment discussing muted versus chromatic grays for our learning. At the end of our discussion today, we will spend just a few minutes looking at the differences between muted color and chromatic grays so that we can continue to grow our understanding around all the nuances of this color stuff. So in part one, as I mentioned previously, we discussed the value keys as outlined by Itten in 1973 and others in Menz's 
book color in spinning. To illustrate the value keys, both major and minor, I decided to dive into the fiber I'd purchased for this study and see what I could create. So with varying success, I was able to create nests to illustrate each value key. If I've totally lost you, please have a watch back at part one that was released at the beginning of this month. It's linked down below. Just a couple of dollars per month will give you access. My process started with carding and spinning up seven nests of fiber, each about five grams, and then knitting some little swatches to see what would happen to the fabric. Carding up these little nests of fiber, I only put them through the carder one time to combine them for ease of spinning, but not to blend them, or at least very minimally. The results were really interesting. So first, to create the nests for the major keys, I needed both light and dark fibers as well as middle values. I used my value scale that I'd spun to be sure that I had a good mix of the right values in the nests of unspun fiber. From there, I made sure to include the correct mix of value that was to be dominant in that particular key. This photo shows the nests of fiber for the high major, the middle major, and the low major. Note that for each of the nests of fiber, there is both light and dark, but less or more, depending on the key I was attempting to demonstrate. I will note that the low major nest of fiber was bundled in a way that you can't see as much of the dark fiber, which was evident when unwrapped and opened up for spinning. Second, I created the same net set of nests for the minor keys. This photo shows the nests for high minor, middle minor, and low minor. Unlike in the major keys, there isn't that range of value in the minor keys, so you won't see the range in value in each nest of fiber, but instead each remains solidly within its value range. High minor is only the high values, middle, only middle, and so on. Third, I created a nest that displayed extended middle minor, which is elusive and best seen next to middle minor and middle major. It uses an extended set of values, but not quite as wide a range as middle major. Extended middle minor is pictured in the middle here with the other two flanking it. Seeing them in a row helps us understand how they relate to and differ from one another. Having made all these little nests of fiber, I got to the spinning and spun each, spun up each to see what I had created. The skeins were really interesting, but none of them shouted which key they fit within. While I knew because I'd been working with them for a week or so in creating them, I don't know that someone else could easily be able to identify them. In the major keys, you can see in the yarns and the fabric that there was a wide range of value, but you have to really look closely. The swatch and the skein that were created for high major could fit in middle major. One also has to look very closely to see the dark values in the swatch. The medium blue I added to show the range of values in the nest of fiber dominates in the little swatched fabric. I needed to add more white or light values. One can see quickly how nuanced it is. The middle major is typical of a lot of yarns we spin and we can see the light and dark values within the fabric and the yarn. Overall though, this is in the middle value range and it worked quite well. Low major is interesting because the light values and the white wool that I added for the range of values is almost lost within the fabric. And yet, so is the dark it almost came out to be more of a middle major uh, swatch of fabric, which is really interesting. As I looked at the minor keys, I felt each of these illustrated each key nicely. The middle minor took on an almost gray look um, to it after spinning. It looked a lot like some of the complement blends that I had made at the beginning of the study that I shared on the podcast. And I was drawn to the middle value knitted samples the most of all of the knitted swatches. I could see them clearly as sweaters, garments, woven items, and more. 
Finally, in the extended middle minor, while the viewer is still able to see the darker values within the skein and the fabric, the lighter values in the white wool are almost completely lost. If the viewer were to look really closely at the fabric, you would be able to see the lighter values heathered throughout the fabric. Overall, there are pastel-like areas and more nuance than the middle minor skein, but not as much as the middle major. Seeing these three side by side helps to visualize the differences. And while this experience exercise was a lot of work, I would highly recommend that you take it on and share your findings with the community. I learned a lot and I realized very quickly that it is much harder to create these keys than we might initially think. So go through your stash and see if you can find some braids that of hand painted fiber that fit within each of the keys and spin them up. See if you can spot the differences once they are spun and assign them to their respective keys. If nothing else, you will spin some of your stash and learn a few things. So let's see what the community did with this experimentation. It was super interesting. Remember from part one that each month I will be putting out a call to the community for their interpretations on contrast of value or the contrast that is being studied that month. The call that went out to the community was as follows. So for contrast of value, I would like to see some sample skeins of one or more of the value keys, high major, middle major, low major, high minor, middle minor, low minor, and extended middle minor. The value keys are nicely outlined in Menz's book, but if you'd like some simple definitions, just reply here and I'll provide those, which I did end up providing in the Slack channel for people that wanted to participate. See what you can come up with when you blend a few hues, shades, and tints together, reflecting on which value key it fits within. And if you want to take one step further, you can even reflect on what you might make with the yarn if given the chance. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so let me show you what they did. So Ava shares with us her experimentations here. I thought that using the blending board to make Rolags would be a good way of going about the contrast of value studies, and I started with the major keys. I really loved making Rolags and loved the challenge of translating these keys into Rolags. So first I went through some scrap yarn I got from my local yarn shop, and I separated them into low, middle, and high, and blended them on hand cards with some fiber to make a more cohesive blend. Those are shown in the first four photos, and then I blended two colors each for the low, middle, and high groups. I put half of each in its respective group and split the other half to divide between the groups it was um, an outlier from. So, for example, the high group would have half of two different high colors and one-fourth of each middle and low color in addition to the scrap yarn blend. After seeing each grouping, I thought it was too balanced between all three groups. So I added an additional high color to the high group and the same for the others. These groupings are shown in the fourth and in the fifth and sixth photo. One is of the actual colors and the other is a gray scale to see just how the value to see the value of the colors. I wanted to use a lot of the same colors in each proportion as a point of comparison which I thought would um, which I thought would work for the major keys since they all contain all values, but I will have to figure out something else for the minor keys since to my understanding they don't contain all the values, but only the values in their own group and close outliers, but I might be misunderstanding. You are absolutely right, Ava. The next step will be to combine them all on the blending board and then to spin and I can't wait to see how they come out. Awesome, Ava. I can't wait to see what you come up with and what the spinning ends up looking like. And please don't forget to share um, so that I can share it here. So Dominique snuck in and uh, shared one more project with us and I wanted to read for you what she shared. Here are the roll eggs I made for the major keys from the piles of fiber in my previous post. I didn't want large stri stripes of color, but rather a more randomized pattern with smaller bursts of color, which also allows for some of the colors to combine together. 
I also added a little sari silk to each one. I love the way the Rolex turned out and it's definitely been an informative experiment to see how they are spinning up. I'm also done spinning my last set, so should have these photos up soon with some reflections on how they each spun up. I will try to include those in next month's community participation uh, for our Spinning Pearls vlog. I love seeing how the same colors in different proportions to each other can really shift the overall effect. The last photo I included is a photo of the middle major key being spun up. Thank you so much. Um, that was from Ava. Sorry, I said Dominique, but I meant Ava. Uh, thank you so much, Ava, for, for including uh, this work. And I look forward to seeing your finished yarn. And I'll share it in our Spinning Pearls next month. This next one is from Dominique. Um, who shares her value exercise. For contrast of value, I tried to sort my fibers by value. I made one set of 1.5 grams of three colors in each group for the minor keys. Uh, and then for the major keys, I added to each group 0.2 grams of each of the six other colors. For the minor middle extended, I got I took one gram of each of the middle group and 0.75 grams of the nearest color in value of the adjacent group. I love how technical Dominique's being here. I put this on the blending board for a minimal blending and I spun across the top to keep the colors separated. On the mini skeins pictured, the value keys are on the left, the minor on in the middle, and the middle minor extended is on the right. And those photos are just cycling through so that you guys can see them all. So this is Dominique's uh, skeins here so that you guys can, can see what she ended up creating. And you can really see how in the major keys, you can see the dark running through, you can see the light in the minor keys, you can see that they just fit so beautifully into just that each of its uh, value keys. So whether it's high minor, middle minor or low minor, and then you can see the extended one that's over on the side there, the extended middle minor, which is such an interesting um, experiment to see if you can attain that elusive middle minor extended. Very, very well done, Dominique. Thank you. So Amanda did quite a few experiments for this contrast exercise. So I'm going to share them in order of how she shared them just for clarity so that you guys can see what she did. And it's really cool what she did. So thank you so much, Amanda, for being so thorough. So this is a contrast of value uh, sample set number one. So a there were four colors, navy, olive, cyan, and pink, dark, mid, mid, and then high mid. And the colors were laid as large stripes of fiber on the blending board and then rolled off as Rolex. The Rolex were spun short forward, then chain plied. Aren't those the most beautiful Rolex you've ever seen? The colors are just on point. In each sample, one color dominates with over half of the fiber in that sample being of a single color. I don't think the pink is a of high high enough value to really push the set into the quote major category. So then they must be minor harmonies. The range of values, which because they are all the same colors for each skein, is more extended than I often see in books that define the minor harmonies. Still, I think that what we have here is that one, the navy domi dominant sample is low minor. Two, the olive dominant sample and the cyan dominant sample are middle minor. And three, the pink dominant sample is high minor. When you look at paintings and such as sam as examples of the minor harmonies, they still do include tiny amounts of colors with values outside of their keys definition. I'd be curious to hear what you all think. And please chime in, comment below. Thank you, Amanda. This second set is sample set number two. Three colors, dark purple, olive, natural white, dark mid and high, aren't these skeins beautiful? Each color was spun as a single, then each sample was plied as a standard four ply yarn. Two plies of the dominant color for the sample managed um, in the plying as a bracelet and one ply each of the remaining colors. 
This set was created to play with the major keys. What we have here is number one, two dark plies and one mid ply and one light ply for low minor. Uh, number two was one dark ply of uh, one dark ply and the second set of samples has one dark ply, two mid plies and one light ply for a middle major. And then number three is one dark ply, one mid ply and two light plies for high major. The knit samples um, from sample set number two are here as well. Aren't they incredible? And you can really see the difference. Like you can really see how they move through and how different they are in the grade scale. So thank you, Amanda, for all of your hard work. I really appreciate it. This next one is also from Amanda. Guys, can you get your shoes on and get all your stuff? Nora, get something to do at Starbucks. This is sample set number three. Um, Continuing on the same theme of marled yarns or combo plying, I thought I would make some skeins in the minor keys with a more restricted range of values. The low minor is one ply black, one ply navy, one ply dark purple. The middle minor is one ply saffron yellow, my favorite, one ply rust red, one ply warm red. And then for the high minor, one ply snow white, one ply dull white and fawn, and one ply of pale lemon. That's this one here. These yarns are my favorite using way of using sem solid or semi-solid colors of fiber. I love the way they work out in simple knits and woven fabrics. The knit samples um, are here as well. Thank you so much, Amanda, for doing all of that work. I really appreciate it. And it's really cool to see and be able to share it here. And finally, here is a start to Sarah's value scale. This is a wonderful example of how the fiber looks, what the fiber looks like before you start spinning. Here is my value scale. I used the same fleece and dyed the black using gay wool dyes, seven grams of coal plus one gram of indigo to 50 grams of fleece. I am happy with the color and originally my black had a prominent pink undertone, which I didn't like. The colors are in 10% increments and I am amazed when I put samples of colored blended fibers next to these grayscale value samples as I can actually see what approximate value they are. Isn't that cool? I had never considered this before. What a great exercise. Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you everyone for sharing your work. I really appreciate that it takes time and it is such a pleasure and an honor to be able to offer a platform where we can learn together. Thank you so much. So let's chat a little bit about chromatic grays. I'd mentioned them in part one of this month's content and asked if anyone was interested in learning a bit more about them. They are super interesting because they are not just muted color, but actually more subtle than that. When I've been combining black, white, equal parts black, white to create gray and complements of a hue, I've been creating what we can refer to as muted color. These colors lie just outside the prismatic zone. That's from CoMD class 19. When we talk about prismatic color, we are discussing the more pure, the most pure hue possible. Just slightly desaturated or muted are those muted colors that we just mentioned. Further along though, we can create chromatic grays, which exhibit a subtle but discernible hue and are created by adding larger amounts of complement and white, also from CoMD class 19. When I start first started researching this, this is not at all what I expected. When we explore a color wheel with chromatic grays and muted colors present, however, this is exactly what we see. By, remo by removing more and more of the hue, we land in the center at chromatic gray. By playing with these ideas, we can create much more complex color, whether in dyeing or combing or combining pre-dyed fiber as I have been doing throughout our experimentations. There are many in the community who are playing with these ideas as well, so please have a look at their work and see what you can learn from them. As an exercise to help you understand this without having to card a bunch of fiber together and spin, is to pull out your paints and start with the purest hues you have and begin combining the complements. Next, 
with your own new colors, uh, such as yellow and purple, begin adding white and see what you can create. In paint, this is a way to create darker, complex colors without using black. It's very interesting. If you are feeling really ambitious, translate this onto fiber and spin up some sample skeins. I encourage you to try these exercises and share your work with us in the Slack channel or on Ravelry. Remember in the Slack channel to use hashtag year of color. That channel has been blowing up since January and it's been really fun to see. As always, share your findings with us either on the Slack channel under hashtag general or in the Ravelry group and be sure to share your projects, your spins and your makes using hashtag wool and spinning so that others can see your progress. And don't hesitate to tag me and Rebecca so that we can see your stuff as well. Until next time, happy spinning everyone. Bye for now.